Hello, listeners. As an enhancement to your listening experience, I am now going to present these archive episodes unedited in their entirety, which includes all of my afterthoughts. So, continue listening after the outro music if you want to hear what I thought of the episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please support it by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. And now I can also accept Zelle and Venmo. Just use my email address, spacerockethistory at gmail.com. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Then I feel out. Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 257 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 12, Return, Reentry, and Splashdown. Continuing from the previous episode, the trans-Earth injection burn was successful, and Conrad, Bean, and Gordon were on their way home inside Yankee Clipper. If Conrad would have got his way, he would have been happy to fire up that SPS engine longer for the trans-Earth injection burn than the flight plan called for, and come barreling out of lunar orbit so fast that they would have trimmed a day off the return. But he knew Houston wasn't about to let him do that. The return flight was uneventful. A mid-course correction maneuver occurred on November 22nd, when Apollo 12 was about 208,000 miles from Earth. On November 23rd, when the spacecraft was 108,000 miles from Earth, The crew held a televised news conference, followed by a long sleep period. A second scheduled mid-course correction maneuver was not even needed. There was plenty of time to think on the way back, and Conrad did. He was proud of Apollo 12. They had proven the pinpoint landing capability and accomplished their other objectives, except one, the TV camera coverage of the moonwalks. But... Now, with pinpoint landing capability, astronauts could go to the places the scientists wanted them to. Along with Conrad's immense feeling of elation and satisfaction, there was something else, something he hadn't expected. After seven years of eating, sleeping, and breathing Apollo, he had finally completed his mission. And it had been near perfect. And now... Just like that, it was over. The flying had been brief but challenging. The sights had been the most spectacular of his life. And yet, going to the moon wasn't what Conrad had expected. Yes, it was spectacular, but it wasn't momentous. Looking back on it, now he couldn't shake the feeling that his mission had been so much like the training that it was almost anticlimactic. Take away the weightlessness and the view, and he might as well have been in the simulator. Seven years ago, Conrad told himself that if he made it to the moon, he wouldn't let it change him, and he had no worries that it would. Conrad kept these thoughts to himself as Yankee Clipper headed home, and he had no idea whether his crewmates felt the same way. He was quite surprised when Al Bean turned to him one day and said, 
It's kind of like the song they called, Is That All There Is? It was just like Al could read Pete's mind. During the return, Bean was pretty much out of it, too. Or at least he seemed that way to Conrad and Gordon. He was spending much of his time on the way back to Earth, sacked out in his sleeping bag. Not surprisingly, he had peaked for the landing and the moonwalks, and the trip home was definitely anticlimactic. Which brings us to re-entry. Right away, the astronauts realized they could see the horizon of the Earth. For the first time in ten days, the Earth loomed large beyond Yankee Clipper's windows, and Pete Conrad was glad to see it. Hello, world, Conrad said. Conrad had flown twice in Earth orbit, but now something looked different. It was the speed. He realized they were traveling much faster than he ever had on Gemini. Bean glanced out and saw the Hawaiian Islands moving past with astonishing swiftness. Look out your side window, he told Gordon. Son of a gun, Gordon said. Making knots, aren't we? That was an understatement. Ten days ago, their Saturn V rocket had catapulted Bean and his crewmates out of Earth's gravitational clutches. Now their home planet was pulling them back at more than 24,000 miles per hour twelve times faster than a high-speed rifle bullet. Boy, said Bean, we are really hauling. You're going to slow down in a minute, Gordon said. Fifteen seconds. Okay, Bean said, standing by. Ten seconds. Five, three, two, one. On the instrument panel, a light labeled point zero five g signaled that Yankee Clipper was beginning to decelerate. Bean looked outside and saw that the command module was surrounded by a pulsating eerie light caused by friction with gas molecules in the tenuous upper atmosphere. It was like flying inside a neon tube. When the maneuvering thrusters fired, their flame momentarily disturbed the wake, and the craft's turning motions twisted the unearthly trail into a glowing corkscrew. Mamma mia, Bean exclaimed. That is fantastic. Hang on to your hats, ears, and overcoats, gang, Dick Gordon announced. G-forces built up rapidly as the command module slammed into the denser layers of air, pressing the three men into their couches. Outside temperatures built up to thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. Only the command module's heat shield saved the crew from incineration. Inside Yankee Clipper, they barely noticed any change in temperature. But during the trip back to Earth, moisture condensed in the command module's docking tunnel. Now, the return of gravity sent it raining down on Pete Conrad, who was in the line of fire. I'm getting soaking wet, Conrad laughed. To Bean, Yankee Clipper decelerated for what seemed like a small eternity. He realized, for the first time, how fast 24,000 miles per hour really was, as G-forces built up to six and a half times normal gravity. After ten days in weightlessness, it felt like a ton. The onboard computer steered the command module on a precise path through the atmosphere, but everyone knew that an error of even a fraction of a degree would send the spacecraft skipping out of the atmosphere like a flat stone flung across waters of the pond. Gordon was ready to take over in case the computer failed, but that was something he'd rather not have to do. As satisfying as it would be to fly the re-entry, Gordon knew it would be risky without the computer. There was no backup system. Now Gordon talked to the computer as though it was a real crew member. Hold that lift vector down. Hold it down, he said. 
The glowing sheath of ionized gas surrounding Yankee Clipper had blocked out radio contact with mission control. But now, as the spacecraft slowed to a fraction of its original speed, communications returned. Hello, Houston, Conrad said. You read Apollo 12 out of blackout. Roger 12, reading you loud and clear now. Okay, Conrad said. It's right on the money. Now the altimeter began to register their diminishing altitude. 50K, Conrad reported. At 30,000 feet, explosive charges would jettison the command module's apex cover and deploy a set of drogue parachutes. That is, if the lightning strike from 10 days earlier did not damage the mechanism. Stand by for drogues, Gordon called. There was a loud bang and Bean saw the apex cover fly away. The drogue chutes streamed upward, pulling their lines taut as they slowed the falling command module. Dick Gordon told Houston, Those drogues look gorgeous. Okay, Conrad said. Stand by for mains. As Bean watched the drogues cut loose and three main parachutes appeared, long moments passed as he waited to see them fully open. At last, they did, blossoming into a trio of orange and white canopies. Hello, Houston, Gordon announced. Three gorgeous, beautiful shoots. As Yankee Clipper descended, Conrad, Gordon, and Bean went through their checklist for landing, including dumping the command module's excess thruster fuel overboard. For a few seconds, the thrusters spat flames that danced alarmingly close to the parachute lines. Now the men could hear the transmission from the approaching recovery helicopter. We have a visual on you passing through 4,000 feet. Meanwhile, out in the Pacific, the aircraft carrier USS Hornet was steaming toward the splashdown point. With only a few hundred feet to go, Bean was ready to perform an important task. After the moment of splashdown, he would punch two circuit breakers, allowing Gordon to cast off the parachutes. Otherwise, the wind could drag the command module through the water, causing it to turn on its edge. If that happened, the men would have to wait for long minutes while a set of inflatable bags on the spacecraft nose righted them. With a powerful slap, the command module struck the water. Bean felt a jolt, as if he had been tackled. He also felt a little dizzy but he wasn't going to let that interfere with doing his job. Bean heard Dick Gordon say, Hey, Al, hit the breakers. But it was too late. By the time Bean pushed in the circuit breakers and Gordon cut the parachutes loose, the command module was already turning over. Gordon said, Al, what happened? Bean replied, Nothing happened. What are you talking about? Bean looked over at his surprised crewmates. You're bleeding, Conrad said. The movie camera came loose when we hit, and it conks you on the head. I saw it go whistling down out of the corner of my eye. Oh, said Bean, it must have knocked me out for a few seconds. I didn't even know. Now there was nothing to do but wait for the recovery swimmers to arrive. Bean looked at the expanse of sky and ocean outside his window, entranced by the motions of waves and clouds. He realized that for the last ten days he hadn't seen anything move except his crewmates and their spacecraft. Even out here, in the middle of the Pacific, his home planet was a sensory feast. And now, the uninterrupted splashdown of Apollo 12 as recorded by NASA. If you listen closely, you can hear the air boss and the recovery helicopter. I apologize for the quality of this clip. There is no atmosphere at this time. At uh, 400,000 uh, feet. Houston, coming up on blackout, we'll see you at 328. Apollo 12 uh, should have begun its blackout some seven uh, three blackout. Uh, we should be in blackout uh, for some two and a half more minutes from this time. We copied the uh, Hornet is uh, heading south uh, 12 knots uh, for its uh, 
terminal position uh, for splash, which would be uh, 5.25 uh, nautical miles uh, north of our target point. Apollo Control, Justin, uh, recovery reports the Hornet uh, has uh, radar contact on Apollo 12. Less than uh, 30 seconds away from the time when uh, the blackout period should uh, be ended. Uh, Mission Control uh, may try to get the Yankee Clipper between the end blackout and drove deploy, which occurs at some 23,000 feet uh, to get the readings off of the uh, computer display keyboard. But its uh, current plan is not to attempt to contact uh, the Yankee Clipper after drills have been deployed. Apollo 12, Houston, over. Hello, Apollo 12, Houston, over. Apollo Control, Houston, a report uh, from the Hornet that indicates that that radar contact uh, showed a uh, a uh, range of uh, 103 nautical miles and uh, a bearing of uh, 261 degrees. Well, we're reading it loud and clear now. Okay, it's right on the mic. All right, we can do it, please. The first time I got a challenge, I was thought I'd wipe all the water out of the tunnel. Roger, well. Very good uh, voice reception uh, through the lab. Hornet advises uh, radar contact now with a range of 69 uh, nautical miles, 69 nautical miles, with an altitude of 121,000 feet. We're about a minute and a half away now from time of uh, drill deploy. This is Apollo Control Houston. Then we have radar and SN contacts on you. Roger. Al Bean reports uh, deployment of the drills. Less than 10 seconds away from main chute deployment. Al Bean uh, reports uh, three main chutes have deployed. And we're at 8,000 feet on the way down in great shape. Well, Houston, uh, give us your lat long, please. Now, boss, we read your lat clear, we're okay. Roger, I'll call it 12. That's your contract. This is recovery. I am three miles north of the 300 radio three miles. I have a visual. He is bearing one. November 24, 1969, following the same nominal re-entry procedure scheduled for Apollo 11, Apollo 12 ended its 10-day flight by splashing down in the Pacific Ocean at 15 degrees 46 minutes south latitude and 165 degrees 9 minutes west. Splashdown occurred about 3 miles from the target area and 3 miles south of and within the sight of the recovery ship USS Hornet.
The Apollo 12 flight lasted 244 hours, 36 minutes, 25 seconds, which was just 62 seconds longer than planned. The astronauts were taken by helicopter to the Hornet, and during the helicopter ride, they changed into protective suits. Upon arrival on the Hornet, they went directly into their special quarantine trailer for the trip back to Houston, where they would wait out the balance of a 21-day quarantine in the Space Center's Lunar Receiving Laboratory. Here's the news coverage of the astronauts walking between the helicopter and the quarantine trailer. Here you see that stuff now being moved into place by John Stonecipher on the right, Fred Sponholz on the left of the NASA recovery team. The three astronauts now coming forward and with their respirators on. I'll be darned if I can tell which is who. The three astronauts now walking briefly across the hull deck and into the to be locked up again. There's the doctor, Dr. Jernigan, and Randy Stone, the technician inside. And they will remain now in quarantine for another 18 days, which is the full three weeks. They count the three-day trip back from the moon as part of that quarantine. The helicopter number 66 being rolled away from that spot. It will be taken back to the flight deck, where it, too, will be decontaminated. It will be filled with formaldehyde gas and that presumably will be the end of all moon bugs if there are any in there. Now you see a picture of the... Now safely inside their trailer, the three men were just happy to be back on Earth. Pete and Dick sipped martinis watching the flight surgeon sew up the cut above Al Bean's eye, and they lent a hand by sterilizing the wound with the contents of their glasses. As if they needed a reason to be any happier, they received a phone call from President Nixon, who told them, I'm promoting you to Captain Conrad, Captain Gordon, and Captain Bean. Astronauts also received a call from NASA Administrator Thomas Paine. But I, I certainly want to appreciate the, I want to send the appreciation of all of us here at NASA for the tremendous job that you did for all of us. And uh, the scientists are 
extremely excited about the results that are coming back. They're looking forward to getting at that 90 pounds of sample you brought, and every one of us is just tickled to death with that magnificent job you did. So thanks a lot, fellas. Well, we enjoyed it, sir. It was our pleasure. Yeah, we sure, thank you, Dr. Payne. We sure did. We were proud to represent the country on the moon, believe me. Fine. Well, I look forward to seeing you out in Houston in a few days. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thank good night. Thank you, sir. The MQF. <laughs> right on. Good night. Quarantine passed easily for the crew, and Alan Bean even realized quarantine was actually a good idea. Not because he and his crewmates had any moon germs, but because it gave them a chance to get through their post-mission reports and debriefings without everyday distractions. Soon, they emerged into bright December sunshine to begin a round of parades, dinner at the White House, and a world tour for the President aboard Air Force One. It was all wonderful, but it gave Bean a new appreciation for normal life. After dining with kings and prime ministers, Bean returned to Houston, glad to simply have a chat with his next-door neighbors. Sometime after quarantine, Pete Conrad got his crew together for a survival meeting of sorts. It was time to talk about their futures. For his own part, Conrad had not known how he might feel about the moon after the flight, but now that he was home, he already knew he wanted to go back. It was a spectacular place, and he had proved to himself that it was also a fine workplace. Before the flight, he had always daydreamed that he and Gordon and Bean would return to the moon as commanders of their own missions. Gordon would land on Apollo 18, Bean on 19, and himself on 20. There had been talk about bringing along a one-man lunar flyer for those last two missions to expand the range of an astronaut in search of discoveries. In Conrad's daydreams, he and Bean would develop the flyer and then test it out on their missions. But the flyer had been canceled in favor of a four-wheeled lunar roving vehicle, and it was clear now that budget cuts would force NASA to cancel the final lunar landing, Apollo 20, to free up a Saturn V for its Earth orbit space station project. Apollo 18 and 19 didn't look much more secure either. For all their jokes about staying together as a crew forever, Conrad, Gordon, and Bean knew they would have to break up. Conrad planned to get out of Apollo and onto the space station project because that's where the available seats were. He told his crew that they should do the same, and Bean planned to take his advice. But Dick Gordon decided to stay on. Going by the pattern of Deke Slayton's crew rotation, he would probably be assigned as backup commander for Apollo 15 and then commander of Apollo 18. Conrad reminded him that Apollo 18 could disappear, but Gordon said he would take his chances. Having come so close to his goal, he couldn't give up now. In conclusion... I want to mention some of the accomplishments of the Apollo 12 mission. Apollo 12 proved that a pinpoint landing on the moon was possible, and the landing was so precise that Conrad and Bean were able to walk to the surveyor. In fact, Apollo 12 was the only moon mission in which the astronauts were able to visit another spacecraft as well as bring pieces of it back to Earth which led to a better understanding of what happens to equipment exposed to unfiltered solar radiation over a period of years. The Apollo 12 astronauts deployed the ALSEP package of experiments, including a passive seismic experiment, a lunar surface magnetometer experiment, solar wind spectrometer experiment, a super thermal ion detector experiment, and a cold cathode ion gauge experiment. Apollo 12 astronauts performed a selenological 
inspection survey and returned soil and rock samples from a mare area of the moon. In doing so, they further developed human capability to work in the lunar environment and set records for lunar surface extravehicular operations. They also took photographs of potential future landing sites and future exploration sites. But the Apollo 12 mission was not a complete success. Due to a broken television camera, the two moonwalks were not seen by audiences back on Earth. However, for a mission that began disastrously with lightning strikes nearly causing an abort, Apollo 12 ended with nearly every objective achieved and returned the crew safely to Earth. Salutations from the foothills of North Carolina. This is Michael Annis, your host, and I wanted to say thanks for listening to episode number 257 of the Space Rocket History Podcast entitled Apollo 12, Return, Reentry, and Splashdown. Hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a pleasure bringing it to you. want to give a big shout out to all my longtime listeners. Thanks for staying subscribed and extend a warm welcome to my new listeners. I am glad you're here. In case you didn't notice, I have added more episodes to the Archive Podcast. We now have episodes 1 through 71 available on iTunes, Google Play, and all your favorite podcatchers. Just look for the Space Rocket History Archive. Today, we salute the Apollo-level donors. There are 77 so far this year. Apollo donors contribute $50 or more during the calendar year. Thank you very much for your continued support, Apollo donors. Okay, I had uh, several afterthoughts about this week's episode. I want to credit my sources, A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, Rocket Man by Nancy Conrad, The Apollo 12 Flight Journal, and Apollo, an eyewitness account by Alan Bean. Well, Apollo 12 is in the bag. Mission Control has started and finished the Splashdown Party. (laughs) What a great mission and what an accomplishment, especially starting off with a lightning strike. Can you imagine that? I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It took 23 episodes to cover this mission, and I really hope that I have done this mission Apollo 12 justice. Joining Apollo 12 in the bag is the year 1969 and the decade of the 1960s. At last, we will be moving on to the 1970s next week. (laughs) I do want to apologize for the quality of some of that audio. It was uh, pretty bad. I edited it down and cut out the parts where no one was speaking, and some of the parts I just couldn't make out, so I cut those out as well. So I had a 16-minute clip. And that was edited down to about five minutes. Also, I wanted to mention, if you would like to visit the Apollo 12 command module, as of the release of this podcast episode, that is June 7, 2018, it is located at the Virginia Air and Space Center in Hampton, Virginia. I have been there to see it, and it is worth the worth seeing if you're in the area, so I would definitely recommend it. Now, as Yankee Clipper sails into the sunset, I have just a little bit of bonus coverage of the splashdown. On your screen, yes, it's a beautiful picture on the screen. A clear, beautiful view of the command module coming down in a big patch of clear sky directly ahead of the bow of the Hornet. There's the module itself, suspended under the spacecraft with its three parachutes in the morning sun here in mid-Pacific. We couldn't ask for a better view. If we're lucky, we will also be close enough to get a good picture of the splashdown, which now is about two or three minutes away. The astronauts have just made a radio report 
They say all is okay, all is okay. The first astronaut radio report received here aboard ship. Where's Gary? Helicopter pilot told me he thought he could do it in his sleep. They've given over it so many times, and they have done it in the darkness. They've done it in rough seas, calm seas, so they really should be able to do it. There you see splashdown. Apollo 12 has ended its flight to the moon and has returned to the mid-Pacific. Okay, I have posted some pictures and the audio for this episode on my homepage, spacerockethistory.com. Hope you check that out. I was pleased to receive six donations to support the podcast over the past week. Bruce W. from Atlanta, Georgia donated at the Apollo level and earned his moon emoji. Mark U. from South Dakota sent in another donation this year, moving him to the Soyuz level with rocket emoji. Scott H. from Washington donated at the Soyuz level. Christopher L. from Australia donated at the Vostok level and earned his moon emoji. Jeffrey H. pledged on Patreon at the Apollo level. And X. Machinist pledged on Patreon at the Vostok level. Our Patreon donors are still at 171. We lost two and gained two over the past week. Our goal is to reach 218 for 2018. And our overall donors have reached 269 with a goal of reaching 418 in 2018. For those of you enjoying the content provided here and have not donated yet in 2018, please consider supporting the podcast if you're financially able. Keep in mind, Space Rocket History is entirely listener-funded. I depend upon your financial support to keep the podcast going. To support the podcast, go to the homepage at spacerockethistory.com, click on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. All donors are rewarded with their name on the donors page at the level they choose to donate. Now, for those of you who have already donated in 2018, I certainly appreciate it. I have another surprise to give away this week. To select the winner, Mrs. SRH gave every 2018 donor a number. Then she put the range in Google's random number generator and got the number for John Graham. John Graham, if you would email me, Mike at SpaceRocketHistory.com, and tell me your address and we will mail this out to you. Congratulations, John. Okay, folks, that's all I've got for this week. I hope to have episode 258 posted by next Thursday. So long for now.